We're delighted to have you here. This is an event that uh, we look forward to uh, uh, with great enthusiasm here at Harris. It celebrates the partnership between, uh, between Harris and the Institute of Politics. We see the Institute of Politics as being uh, an integral part of the university and one that we see that we gain great advantage from having here. Uh, and in its first full year, and for those of you not familiar with the academic calendar, the full year just started. So our year starts now, everything else was last year. Uh, for the first full year of its existence, we're delighted to welcome uh, some of the new fellows for the Institute of Politics here tonight to participate in a conversation with a speaker whom I will not introduce because my, my task as a, as a menial in this operation is to introduce somebody who will then introduce somebody else who will then introduce the speaker. So <laughs> in case you're wondering what's going on, that's the approximate sequence of event. I may have left somebody out, but it's something of that order. It's a pleasure for me to introduce somebody who genuinely needs no introduction, and therefore I will give him very little. Uh, David Axelrod is, is widely known to be a distinguished senior fellow here at the University of Chicago Harris School. Less well known is that he is director of the Institute of Politics, and I'd like to uh, invite David to come up to introduce the next introducer. I hope I'm the last introducer, because I don't know who I'm supposed to throw to if I'm not. <laughs> but, uh, but your comment reminds me of uh, the story of uh, Congressman Mo Udall when he was a freshman member of the House, you've heard this story, uh, and uh, it was the end of a hearing, and of course the, the, f the, the person with the least sen seniority gets to speak last and ask his questions last, and uh, Udall came up and he said, well, everything that needs to be said has been said, but not everybody has had a chance to say it. <laughs> <laughs> that is the role of the second introducer. <laughs> So, uh, first of all, let me say, uh, many of you were in the next room, so I'm not going to uh, repeat what I said there, but it's just a great thrill to see all of you. you. You guys are what the Institute of Politics is all about. We're very happy to uh, partner with Harris because uh, you, many of you have made the choice that you want to make a difference in, uh, in public life in some form or fashion, and you'll be well fortified to do that because of the great education uh, that you're getting here. We hope to add value to that by bringing uh, to the campus practitioners in all realms of the public arena, including commentators, uh, uh, to uh, give you some practical hands-on exposure uh, to these folks. And uh, tonight we're uh, lucky to have uh, one of the m most uh, gifted and uh, interesting uh, commentators on the Washington uh, scene, uh, Mark Leibovich, uh, is uh, well known to readers of the New York Times. He's the national editor of the uh, New York Times magazine. His, his ra are you left-handed? I am, actually. Yeah. So his left-handed pieces uh, <laughs> often come at uh, Washington in a much different way, a sometimes acerbic way. Uh, and now uh, he's written a, 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 re a very readable and interesting commentary on uh, life in our capital called This Town. Uh, so it is a uh, pleasure to welcome uh, Mark to our town. <laughs> and uh, to lead our discussion, uh, we have Steve Edwards, who's the uh, Deputy uh, Director of the uh, Institute of Politics. And Steve uh, is, uh, uh, coordinates our programming and, and does a superb job there. But many of you may remember him, those of you who are from Chicago uh, in the not too distant past as the moderator of uh, uh, Afternoon, Pro what was your, the name of your show? The Afternoon Shift and, and before that 848. Yeah. Yes, uh, on WBEZ radio. And uh, we've made frequent use of his s moderating skills and we will continue to do that. And he's the perfect guy to lead this discussion tonight. And we also have three of our fellows here who are also well suited to join this discussion because they're well familiar with the politics uh, and the uh, idiosyncrasies of Washington, D.C. Amy Walter, who, uh, uh, how many of you weren't next door? Okay, Amy Walter was the uh, political uh, uh, director of ABC News. She now uh, is the uh, national editor, is that what you said? Of, uh, of the Cook Report. 
Uh, those of you who are familiar with the Cook Report know that it's the sort of preeminent uh, publication on uh, elections and, and the politics of our congressional districts, Senate districts, governors' races around the country. Robin Carnahan is the former Secretary of State of Missouri. Um, she, uh, her, her mom was a senator uh, from Missouri. Her dad was a governor of Missouri. Her brother is, the, uh, is a, uh, was a congressman, was a congressman from uh, Missouri. Um, so it's needless to say she's had a little experience with politics. Uh, and Ramesh Panaru is, uh, is an editor of the National Review, uh, a uh, leading com a conservative commentator uh, in the country and someone who uh, has experienced Washington from that perspective. So let me invite all three of you up to take your seats next to, uh, next to Mr. Leibovich and uh, let the uh, conversation begin. Right. David, thank you so much, and thanks to all of you for being here. So let me tell you what we're going to do. Mark and I are going to chat for a bit to talk a little bit about this town, and then we're going to bring Robin and Ramesh and Amy into the conversation. No, it's good. It's good. We're, we're, we're rolling with it. Um, and the three of them will uh, then also really expand the conversation because these are three people who know Washington very, very well. And how many people, by the way, have had a chance to read this book? And it's okay. You don't have to be, be shy if you haven't read the book. Okay, great. So we have some people who've read the book already. Um, this book, for those of you who haven't read it, the title, of course, is This Town, Two Parties and a Funeral. I have to read the subtitle. It's, yeah, it's, it's one of the longest. Take you half the night. Yeah, yeah. Plus, plenty of valet parking in America's gilded capital. It is uh, an engrossing read. I think for those of you that have read it, you'll know what I'm talking about, uh, in part because it's written so insightfully and incisively. And it's a book that uh, has been the buzz book of Washington this summer. And I think perhaps more than any other thing in this book, the most telling anecdote that gives you some clue as to the tone and the underlying message is contained on the back cover. The back jacket says, warning, this town does not contain an index. Those players wishing to know how they came out will need to read the book. <laughs> and it speaks to this culture in Washington of uh, worrying about one's image, about this notion of trying to um, get your next media hit. And Mark, I can't thank you enough for making time for us here today. So please welcome Mark Leibovich. There are some amazing scenes in this book. One of the scenes that people have talked about and written about since this book came out is the scene that you describe of Tim Russert's funeral, the late host and anchor of Meet the Press. But I want to go to a different scene, a scene near the end of the book. It's a scene that you uh, and others sort of talk about as the last party, which is what it was billed, um, at the home of Ben Bradley, the late editor of the Washington Post. Describe what goes on still in this alive. party. Yeah, okay. yeah they'll still, still alive, yes. The, the ex-editor of the Washington the Post. <laughs> 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 I meant the ex-editor. Yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah. um, so describe the scene. Well, um, first of all, thank you so much for having me. Thank you to everyone, David especially. I mean, I, I think um, I don't want to get too much into the it's great to be here, but it's really good to be here. Um, I, I am actually thrilled that this institute exists, um, partly because I know it's going to be great. Um, and some of, one of the great joys of my job is getting to follow politicians to things like the Institute of Politics at uh, the Kennedy School at Harvard uh, or St. Anselm's up in New Hampshire. And uh, you just meet such an incredibly high caliber of political thinker and young people and, and so forth. So anyway, thank you for having me. Um, the, the last party was the second bookend. Uh, of the, it ended the book. It was the last chapter of the book. And it began with Tim Russert's funeral in June of 2008. And this took place uh, at the end, well, actually about midway through December of 2012. It was a few days after the Newtown shootings. Uh, it was one of the many brinksmanship moments up on the hill. Of, I think there was like, it was the fiscal cliff was sort of coming to a head. And it was a pouring rain evening. And Ben Bradley and Sally Quinn were celebrating their annual Christmas party. But it was billed as the last party. Uh, this was Sally Quinn, the, the wife, not widow yet, but the wife of uh, <laughs> Ben Bradley. Thank you, Mark. Um, sorry. Um, who is now 92. And Ben Bradley was and is one of my idols in journalism. He's one of, I spent a good part of my early career just dying to work at the Washington Post while it was being led by Ben Bradley and 
even right after he left. I mean, it was like the one place I really wanted to be. And like a lot of journalists, I got inspired by all the president's men to, to go into the business. And Ben is 92. Um, he's just a really great guy. He's lived a, just a really rich and fascinating and historic life. Um, and he's suffering from dementia. And he has been hanging on. He's been looking great. He hasn't been doing so well in the last few years. And everyone received this invitation to the last party. And it had the look, I mean, everyone sort of looked, looked like a pre-funeral, like sort of a tribute to a giant's life. And uh, it turned out that Sally was doing a play on the end of the Mayan calendar, and because, you know, the world was supposed to end, and that was kind of the theme. But people didn't, people kind of got that it, there was a double message there. So everyone showed up. It was this pouring rain night. And you go in, and it's just everyone there is this legend. I mean, you have Woodward and Bernstein over here and Ben over there greeting people just looking so good and Vernon Jordan and Colin Powell and um, it, it was just wall to wall, people on TV and people that you, I've grown up watching and so forth. And it occurred to me that, first of all, not a single person from the Obama administration was there um, and not a single person, except for Susan Rice, who just that week had been um, basically she did not get the, the nomination for Secretary of State. And um, she was a big news item that particular big, she week. She was the destination, yes. People were swarming her. People wanted to get to Susan Rice because she was in the news that week. Uh, and then Which Amy, is a great thing to be in Washington. It is a great thing to be in, but for a few days, but she wasn't in the news for the right reasons. Anyway, right. Um, but, uh, but Amy Klobuchar, the senator from, from Minnesota, and Debbie Wasserman Schultz, the congresswoman from Florida, were there. They were the only two elected officials I saw there. And uh, we all sort of looked at each other. We were talking at one point, and I think it was Debbie Wasserman Schultz who said, God, I feel like I've walked into a novel. And that was a great sort of moment. And then I said to Amy Klobuchar, who, by the way, this is, uh, here's an, uh, an aside, the Washington Post published an index to this non-indexed book two days after it came out. So everyone knew. <laughs> and I actually ran into Amy Klobuchar two days later. Who's an alum of the University of Harris. Well, yeah. There you go. Well, well she, we were in the green room. This is a great this town story. We were in the green room of this week with George Stephanopoulos where I did my first Sunday interview. Um, this is great. I get to like have sentences like I did my first Sunday interview for the book. <laughs> on, um, but Amy Klobuchar comes walking in and she said, hey, I haven't read your book yet, but I see that I'm on page 321. What did you say about me? <laughs> What did I say about her? I said, oh, she was at the party. But anyway, it was this, this very elegiac moment. And it was both sad and it was both a great party. And uh, it struck me as a place to end it because you had all this stuff going on on both ends of Pennsylvania Avenue. I mean, there was pr presumably one of the reasons no one from the White House was there is because either they weren't invited or they didn't care or they were working. I mean, this was a big moment in the last one of the, in brinksmanship. And it was a momentous moment. Everyone on the Hill was working, or most people on the Hill were working. And it just struck me as something I wanted to capture, and seeing Ben um, looking just amazing, and, and people sort of paying tribute as they were leaving, and Woodward and Bernstein walking out into the rain, and um, uh, Mike Allen getting ready, talking to Bob Schieffer about his that Sunday appearance on Face the Nation, and which we all knew because Major Garrett was, had taken a picture of Mike in the green room or something. It was like this very kind of new media, old media, thing was colliding. And it just struck me as um, a way to end it on something between a nostalgic, maybe sad, maybe uplifting, I don't know, no, but it was just a scene I didn't want to, um, I didn't want to lose. There's this thing in the scene that, that I think comes to life. It's, the, it's the, the Washington that we have lost and are losing and the Washington that we have become uh, as a town. Um, what is it that Washington has turned into, in your view, over the last, say, two decades? Well, I mean, I think one of the main focuses of the book has been the evolution of, of politics, or at least in Washington, to a culture that has rewarded self-service and the, the self-branding ethic in which there is so much money in politics, there is so much media in politics. The next act, the next gig, the next lobbying job or what have you is so readily available that I think it has to shape the way people approach certain levels of public service. I mean, it used to be that you could either get elected or, you know, score that like coveted pinnacle of your career, White House job or chief of staff job to the Speaker of the House and so forth. And 
that would be that would be it. And you know, you would do something else afterwards. But but that and you would, would leave it. Washington in most cases. Well, I think or in oh, some yes, cases. no. I think you know another a, b a big piece of this is that people don't leave anymore. I mean, I think fifty percent of all U.S. senators now go on to become lobbyists after they're either voted out or or they leave office. Uh, that figure compares to, to about three percent in 1974. Uh, it's 42 percent for members of Congress. So again, it, it's it's a new dynamic. Um, there's been a level again. It's it's money being thrown into the political system by corporations, by trade groups, what have you, that allows these next acts to happen. And and again, it's I'm not really begrudging anyone making a living like this. I guess, although that might sound hypocritical when you read some of the book. Yeah, um, there's a lot of maybe there's some big grudging. The yeah. Well, I try a to be, I try to play it pretty straight, <laughs> but uh, maybe <laughs> didn't do a great job. Anyway, so yeah, maybe there's some begrudging there. But look, it, it has changed the culture that. Um, we're talking about. All right. Um, so there are a couple things I want to do here, but uh, I want to throw a hypothetical. So I am uh, a 27-year-old graduate of the Harris School or a 22-year-old graduate of the University of Chicago, and I go to Washington and I get a job, say, as a legislative staffer or a communications aide or something, and I want to make it big time in this town today. What's the playbook? What are the things that I, that I do? Um, in this day and age. In this day and age. Um, to make my mark. Well, I mean, I don't think there's any one place. I mean, I would, this is going to sound like ducky, like I'm ducking it or it's vague. But I, I do think you need to know, it, it, it helps to have some degree of life experience or at least an advanced degree of self-knowledge before you get there to know who you are. Um, a lot of young journalism students and young reporters will say to me, you know, how do you get into why? Because you, you paint such a both frightening but exhilarating picture of covering politics in the political world. How do I get involved? I mean, you know, should I, there's this internship at BuzzFeed and Politico's hiring, you know, some of uh, their 10th Hill reporter or something like that. <laughs> and <coughs> it's true. I mean, there are all these new opportunities available to, to reporters and, and, you know, political staffers because of new media, because of any number of new entities that are starting. And I, I would say now, and I probably wouldn't have said this a year and a half ago, but I would say now that I would encourage people to start somewhere else. Um, I talked to this great young reporter for the Concord Monitor in New Hampshire when I was up at St. Anselm's last week. And one of the brightest young women I've, I've talked to in a long, long time. And, and she was talking about how nervous she is because she reads Politico every day and she reads Mike Allen's playbook every day and she reads and, you know, she watches TV all the time, and she's a political junkie, and, you know, she wants in. I mean, you know, she wants that, those 20,000 Twitter followers, so people know what she has to say about this thing that's unfolding on TV. And I said to her, just like, look, you are fine. I mean, you're at a good paper, you're, you're in a community, you're meeting people that you would not meet otherwise. Um, and, and look, I mean, there's a mystique around the... Uh, just the just these new internet publications, the ones that you know to get on MSNBC and you know get called a strategist at three o'clock in the afternoon on Sunday, and they can put out a tweet about the. I mean, look, I mean, there's something very, I guess, seductive about that because it's an electronic age we live in, and and, and then people sort of order prestige by by media, you know, pecking order and TV appearances and so forth. And and I just like so I would just say, make sure you know who you are or. What you're, or if you're going just for some experience and if you're going to just absorb the environment, which is a great way to spend your 20s if that's what you want to do, just sort of know that you are there to learn at first. And it's very easy to be in a real hurry. And I think, you know, ambitious people are often in a hurry. But, you know, sort of realize that it's a very ongoing education. I, I ask the question because of the inverse, the reality that you paint in this picture of young people today, frankly, people at all generations in Washington. You know, you have the Twitter feed, you're, you're, you're blogging, you're trying to get invited to, to great parties, you're at parties, you're looking not at the person you're talking to, you're looking for the next important person you're supposed to meet. Um, you're worried and hopeful that you can get your next media hit. You're, you know, uh, liberally using the term strategist or consultant in ways that you really haven't earned. Right. Um, commentator, blogger, all of these things are part and parcel of the way in which you get a leg up in this town these days. How did we get to this point in Washington where that became uh, more and more commonplace as you described time and time again in these scenes? Well, I mean, I do think that a lot of 
the blame, if that's the right word, does fall on, on the media. And just the, the, the celebration of both the process of politics, but the gamesmanship of politics. I mean, one of the chapters in the book is devoted to a minor, well, a, a, a press secretary to Daryl Issa, the congressman from California, head of the uh, Republican head of the House Oversight Committee. And his name is Kurt Bardella. He literally pretty much came to Washington right out of high school. He didn't go to college. He got this job. Um, working for Daryl Issa. Um, he was raised on West Wing, basically. There's this whole new generation of young operatives in Washington who did not grow up idolizing Robert Kennedy or Ronald Reagan, but they grew up idolizing Jeb Bartlett or, you know, <laughs> Josh Lyman because, I mean, look, I mean, they all got the same amount of screen time and boy, did that look fun. And, you know, they saw primary colors, they read primary colors or the war room. I mean, it, it is this, this age in which uh, I, Sorry. Keep, keep, I gotta yeah, get these your, guys your in dad, on this. I'm yeah, getting no, the eye we, rolling, the yeah. knowing look, sigh. I, I have to say, the, the town is full of these people. And uh, no, I know, <laughs> I know. No, I don't mean it defensively. But, but the guy, Kurt Bardella, who I devote a great deal of space to, and he had sort of, I became involved in this. It's a long story. You should read it. It's chapter eight, I think. Um, but anyway, he is now a strategist. He just left. Uh, He's a TV strategist. He just left Daryl Issa's office two weeks ago. Said, "Hey, I'm now the head of, Ende I'm now the president and CEO of Endeavor Strategies Inc. We're a media advising group." <laughs> and I'm like, "Okay." And he did that Colorado um, recall election with the gun, you know, legislators. I mean, so he got a big win there after like one week, and he like claimed victory for himself. And uh, last week, a big, I got an email from Mike Allen and a bunch of other people forwarding Kurt's email saying, I'll be making my Fox debut uh, this afternoon at 2 o'clock, appearing with whoever it is, talking about the shutdown and about the Republican strategy. And I'm like, okay, I mean, Kurt's 27, 28. And, and look, so, but again, I mean, someone's got to put these guys on TV and someone's watching it, so. Yeah, uh, I, I want to get Amy and Robin in because I, I saw the eye rolling and the knowing look. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> all right, so, and there's a, there's a microphone, I think, that was, that was trying to walk off the stage. Um, and if you can pop that on. So, Amy, you listen to this, and w w what resonates for you as you listen to the stories that Mark's uh, telling here about Washington culture today? Well, I'm, I'm going to focus on the optimistic part, which I think you, the, the, the great thing about the book is, for as much as it is w worthy of eye rolling and there's de some depressing anecdotes in there. There's also an underlying piece of this, which um, is also the motto that I like to give out to, to aspiring journalists or folks who want to get involved in campaigns who are younger, which is this idea of um, just understanding who you are and what you're willing to do and what you're not willing to do um, to move ahead in your career. If you want to be one of the, if you want to be Josh Lyman, that's fantastic. You also have to decide what else is important to you in your life and what sacrifices you're gonna make to do that. Um, and to be confident enough to make those choices for yourself rather than having make m those being made by other people. The most frustrating thing for me over the course of the last 20 years of being in Washington is that the folks now who are the young journalists did grow up in an age of John Stewart and West Wing, sarcasm, cynicism, snarkiness, and there is not an appreciation of the actual people who are the candidates, that they're actually, like this person sitting right next to me, it's an actual human being. Um, and they, there is this sense that, but you wouldn't know it, but even the way that politics is covered is so much about there are people and products, they're really products that are being uh, promoted or demoted um, in one way, shape or form. And these are young people who want to be followed on Twitter, or get on television, but who probably have never set foot in a campaign before, have never worked on a campaign, have never been in a local elected office, don't understand who the people are, you know, haven't had to sit like I did at one point and recruit volunteers on a campaign. And those are some of the craziest people you're ever gonna meet in your life, people who volunteer for campaigns. <laughs> <laughs> but those are the, that's, that's understanding how this process works um, and understanding how politics works at a county level, at a state level, at a city level. And then you, you should work your way up through. That's what's changed so much. The, could you have gotten a job? You know, I remember when the roll call was the only newspaper in town 
and um, the New York Times and Wall Street Journal and others wouldn't hire folks from Roll Call because they said, well, that's just a local <coughs> paper. You got to go, go back to a real newspaper. I'm going to hire the St. Louis Post-Dispatch political reporter. We're going to hire somebody who's been in the field for a long time. So they were seasoned political reporters who then got promoted to Washington. Now you're going to work for Politico or Roll Call or one of the others and then move your way. Absolutely. No, I mean, I, I, you, I, I'd spent my, basically my entire 20s just begging the Boston Globe or the Boston Herald to hire me. I was working at the Boston Phoenix, which is the weekly there, and I was answering phones for three years, and I hated my job. But they, you know, but it, being in a newsroom, in retrospect, I mean, you overhear conversations, and they got space to fill, and like, hey, you know, I'm an hour from Manchester, New Hampshire, and it was 1992 or 1988, and there's a primary going on, so here I am wandering the streets, and like, it's, there is this sort of, um, I mean, in, in years of paying your dues and being somewhere other than Washington or New York, um, you can, you know, you, you have the serendipity and you have these moments that are really gold. So Robin, you, your family is, as David mentioned in the introduction, has lots of Washington experience. You have Washington experience, but you have uh, deliberately set your career outside of the Beltway for the most part. W why have you decided to stay away um, when you could go to Washington right now and, and relocate there and work for all sorts of firms to do your work and, and work in government? You know, it's, it's a very interesting question because it, it used to be that people would serve in Washington and then they would go home. And it was fascinating, uh, early in my career, a guy named Tom Eagleton was a longtime senator from my state, and he had an 18-year career in the Senate, and he left, and he went back to Missouri. And he never once considered staying in Washington. It was an offensive thing to him to think that he would trade on the, the experience that he'd had in public life. We had another senator, retired five or six years later, Jack Danforth, did the same thing. He came back to Missouri. And so it's really an interesting change that's happened where people want to stay in Washington. And the reason they do it is because they can monetize it, right? That's the whole reason. Um, <coughs> that's a new word, too, by the way. I don't think I heard the word monetize 10 years ago. Maybe, I, maybe I'm new. Well, if you were at the University of Chicago, you know. Yeah, obviously. <laughs> it's exactly right, yeah. Big words. Now, 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 monetize is a very University of Chicago word. <laughs> Well, I've, I've been here one day more than no, you. No. <laughs> but the thing that I think is worth noting is I actually haven't spent that much time in Washington. The strange thing is that my mother is from Washington. Her father was a plumber and her mother was a hairdresser. And my dad, his father was in Congress. So he grew up on a farm in South Missouri, but spent some, he spent every other year in Washington because at that time they only met every other year. And then half the year he'd be back in South Missouri. And so in my family, this whole idea of you go to Washington, you do a little bit, you go back home is a very normal thing. I think that it is worth noting that in our system of government, if you want to actually run for something, guess where you can't run? You can't be from Washington and run for anything, right? They've got a member of Congress, but they don't get to do much. They don't have a member of the Senate. If you want to be a mayor, you can be a Washington or a city council person. But if you want to do something in national or state politics, you have to be from someplace. And so for me, as a young person, I went there. I remember a clerking in law school. I was there for part of the summer and <laughs> professed that I didn't want to go back unless I was elected to something. And because that's the way the town seems to work. Yeah, that example is ringing true in the current race for governor in Virginia. You write a lot about Terry McAuliffe, and while he's ahead of the polls, certainly, he struggled to shed his Washington shackles in some respects uh, when it comes to appealing to voters outstate in Virginia, it seems like. Well, I mean, Terry McAuliffe, if, if you were to ask me what his home realm is, I would say it's the political class. I mean, it's, yes, he physically lives in Virginia, but I mean, he I'm sure he's raising money. I know he's raising money from his political network. I mean, the people he knows are from his political, you know, his political world. And look, that's fine. I mean, it's, and I know that you have to package yourself and you have to present yourself in a way that's appealing to people in Roanoke, Virginia. But yeah, no, I mean, but that's, that's who I think 
Terry McAuliffe is. But I, I think, do think that the notion of staying is, is so core to both this book, but also what Washington has become. And um, What's the revolving doors? It, well, it's the revolving door part. I mean, there's this iconic story of Harry Truman, another Missouri son, just driving home after his serving his, his presidency no with no pension at all. Exactly. But there was this, this road trip from Washington to uh, Independence, Missouri. And um, I assume he landed in Independence. I mean, that's where he's from. Yeah. But um, I mean, presidents are a little different because presidents don't stay in Washington because they don't have to. And if Barack Obama stays in Washington after his presidency, I will be utterly shocked and I will retire. And I think David probably will too. <laughs> um, but no, I mean, I mean Jack Dan. I'm actually doing an event at uh, St. Louis University tomorrow night with Jack Danforth and, and he and Barb. Exactly. So you know all this. You can, <laughs> you can comment. Robin said she got the invitation to that event. Um, but no, I think that's such an incredibly wonderful thing to do. And then, of course, when people do elect to stay in Washington, they say he will be splitting time between his home in Idaho and Washington, which generally means maybe 2%, maybe one visit to Idaho a year, and the rest of the time, you know, Washington or somewhere on the road. At the heart of this, though, I mean, in some respects, it's a question that's alluded to, but it's not really addressed directly in this book, is what impact is all of this having on the quality of our public policy? The quality of our governance. So Ramesh, you've been sitting quietly and patiently. Um, the Washington culture that, that you've witnessed, that you've observed, that you're part of now, um, what impact does it have on those questions? I've tried to avoid becoming part of this town by not reading this town. <laughs> but uh, It makes a good doorstop. I, I, I don't know. I don't know how it's effective this strategy is. Um, well, you know, I've just, I've been in Chicago two, three days now, and uh, the one thing that really struck me uh, going around the city and the campuses is, is there's so much um, architectural playfulness here. There's, there are libraries that look like they've got domes on them, and there are buildings that look like ships, and Robin's staying in a hotel with a balcony that's wavy. And uh, <laughs> DC would never put up with any of this because it's too <laughs> self-important a city. Um, when I, when I first came to D.C., I, I had a, a nice lunch with a, um, uh, a Supreme Court justice who was telling me that, that, uh, <laughs> yeah, that with the, off the record, you know, I, I maintaining my journalistic credibility, too, um, he said, this is the only town where you have friends in theory. And uh, that really struck stuck with me. I thought it was a very profound remark. And, and looking back at it in hindsight, um, what strikes me about it is how completely untrue it is. Because in fact, in every city in the country, there are people who pretend to be friends with other people for reasons of professional advancement. And a lot of the things that we find uh, annoying about DC culture um, are, you know, just regular human foibles, um, just maybe in a slightly more insular environment. One thing that does, though, strike me as having a real impact on the country, uh, though, is that uh, in addition to being insular and incestuous, the, s the political Washington has gotten so rich and so insulated from national economic trends. We, we have a crisis in this country of mass long-term unemployment. I mean, that is a real social crisis, and it barely registers in D.C. That is so 2009. That's over. And it's just sort of not, it's not felt as an urgent matter. It's, uh, it's not in a serious way on the agenda of, of really almost anybody uh, in D.C. And, uh, and I, I do think that has something to do with the way D.C. has developed. Yeah, you write about this. I mean, give us, paint the picture economically, the, the, the wealth that's in D.C. and the disparity that exists between the sort of D.C. economic reality and the rest of the country. Well, I mean, it's the wealthiest metropolitan area in the United States by far. I mean, it's home to seven of the ten wealthiest counties in the United States. I mean, ringing Washington. Um, and, yeah, I mean, the, the economy barely hiccuped in 2008 and 2009. Unemployment rates significantly lower there than, say, in Chicago or uh, other big oh, cities. Oh, absolutely, yeah. All, half of what it is. Yeah, no, so there is, I mean, look, I mean, that absolutely makes a culture, I mean, just see the world differently. And um, 
So yeah, I, mean, I, I just think that I don't think it's any more complicated than, than just sort of weighing the two in contrast. I, I want to come back to the public policy question, but before I do, I want to stay with this <coughs> idea that Ramesh introduced. Because one of the things as I was reading your book that struck me is, you know, in some respects, what you're describing as Ramesh talked about, you could say about, certainly you can say it about LA and Hollywood culture, you can say it about New York and, and the world of high finance and investment banking, you can say it about certain aspects of Chicago, that this is really human nature um, in a particular industry, in a particular environment where people are uh, very ambitious and they have um, real specific goals to advance their own interests, that this isn't necessarily unique to Washington. What's unique to Washington is that they're also entrusted with sort of public policy, and that makes it different. Right. Is there yeah. a different culture here than elsewhere, or is this the same? Well, I mean, you partly answered the question, which is <laughs> that Washington is supposed to be different. It's supposed to be a city built on public service. Um, it's also funded largely by taxpayers, okay? Uh, I mean, yes, Hollywood is, there's a lot of ego and a lot of money and a lot of, a lot of the same opportunism um, or flavors of opportunism that you see in these other sort of quintessentially United States um, bubble worlds. <clears throat> but um, again, I mean, Hollywood's make-believe. I mean, this is for keeps. I mean, this is people's lives. So, I mean, I think that that's a distinction that basically is at the core of everything I'm writing about here. Amy and Robin, what, what impact does the culture of Washington have on the way business gets done or not done and, and the impact of public policy? So I had an interesting experience. As Secretary of State, one of, one of my jobs was to, oh, it was the state level uh, securities regulator. So like the SEC and every state has one. And so during the financial crisis, we had to do lots of things because the SEC in Washington wasn't doing them. And so as Dodd-Frank was coming around and the debate about uh, f uh, finance reform was happening in Washington, I would go out there as head of the regulatory group for the states and have conversations with folks on the Hill. And I remember walking in to the Senate staff or, you know, chief of staff, who were the muckety mucks, whatever, on the committee that was doing the thing. And they were exhausted. They just looked wrung out. I said, what's been going on? They said, we've been in meetings all day. This is just such a big deal. This is so hard. I said, who have you been meeting with? You've been meeting with, meeting with consumer groups? You've been meeting with real Americans who are having problems paying their bills or having problems getting their money? They said, well, no. No, we're meeting with the banks. We're meeting with, the, they started rattling off the names of the banks. And here's the fact. The fact is, the folks that have the lobbyists are the folks that have the money. They're the folks that get the meetings. And they're the folks that are going to give the jobs to all of these staffers on all of these committees when they get done with their public service. And to me, that's the fundamental flaw of what's going on. This revolving door that's happening in Washington where you, the only step is to go out and work for these guys that have been coming to ask you for something while you're supposed to be working for the taxpayers. And that's where it affects public policy to me. And, and I think, I, I mean, I think just if I could add, I mean, this is a plug for a future speaker here, but Jack Abramoff, not the most, um, you know, celebrated figure in Washington or anywhere, but he is, uh, he's speaking here, I guess, so October 15th, October 15th on the stage. Um, <laughs> Noon. He is a fascinating criminal. I mean, pretty fascinating. He, he wrote a book in prison. Uh, it's a memoir, and it's fascinating. I mean, it, the stories he told about how incredibly easy it was for him to basically influence, you know, elected officials, high-level staffers on the Hill, less so in the White House, but mostly on the Hill, was just astounding, and it rings absolutely true. And he says that it's all true now. I mean, he has this great quote in the book, and he told me this too, because I had breakfast with him um, after I read his book. And he said um, he would have these relationships with congressmen or people, you know, staff people on the Hill. And after a while, he knew that he could actually say, hey, you know, you're really sharp. You know, when you're done serving in Congress or when you're done working on the Hill, you gotta come think, start thinking about working for us. And, you know, implicit in that statement is seven-figure salary because, I mean, they were paying huge amounts of money. And, the, you know, de depending on how, I mean, the conversation would almost never end with, I could never even consider that. It was like, well, we should keep talking. And Jack Abramoff said that when he knew someone well enough to have that conversation, he knew that he owned them. He knew that there was essentially some kind of implicit 
agreement that if he continued to serve in a way that maintained their friendship, that maintained this sort of hazy job offer, um, you know, he w they were fine. And I think it's true. Can I raise two? Uh, I want to raise two points. Um, the first is actually during the shutdown, something really interesting has been occurring, which is the actual political class is the class that's saying, whoa, 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 what? This isn't how it works, right? We we all have a deal. Democrats are talking to Republicans. Republicans talk to Democrats. They work in the same firms, right? And they all get the joke, right? And like at some point, right? This this doesn't. It's not supposed to work this way, and it's actually the one thing that's actually working in Washington are the people that say this is actually not good to have the dysfunction. Uh, and it's not just the shutdown. It's what other uh, other pieces right now, especially Republicans saying this to people like us, that the, the system is actually broken the other way around, right? And we can talk about gerrymandering, we can talk about how the voting process works and the people who are being elected. So that's one thing to introduce. This idea that, that the relationships, the long-lasting relationships in Washington across all sides and all spectrums actually have worked to create a bipartisan consensus over Theoretically, time. Theoretically, at least to say problems. that it's, you could solve the problem and we would not be in this place. If it were up to the political class right now in Washington, the establishment, we would not be in a government shutdown right now. The second piece, though, is... So this I, is an example of this town not working in some respects. Uh, this town, right, actually working. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. The other piece of it, too, I guess I get a little bit frustrated when I hear about how bad things are and they were so awesome in the old days and Tip O'Neill and they would go and they'd have a beer and things would work out. That wasn't a Washington that included people that looked like us at all. Um, that wasn't a Washington that was somehow cleaner. The money was getting there, but it was going, it was just going through other channels. They were getting just as influenced. All I have to do is watch Lincoln, right? Here they were trying to abolish slavery. We're not talking about like reducing the deficit. This is ending human slavery and they still had to work on things like patronage and cash under the table right this is this is not something that's new to the process so i guess my feeling too is this is just a new way of doing this it's, in fact it's actually more transparent than it's ever been and there are more people now involved in the process which is making it a little bit messier different kinds of people in the process ramesh your take um just to just to point out the flip side is that that bipartisan consensus that those relationships has have helped to nurture is often wrong. So um, you know I've we had a bipartisan consensus through the 90s and early 2000s. Let's encourage mortgage debt. Um, there was uh, you know it just even just regular like, sort of punditry. Well, of course Harriet Myers is going to be confirmed. Of course. Barack Obama has no chance against the Clinton machine. Uh, of course, an immigration bill is guaranteed to pass this year. Um, and that's because everybody's talking to one another. Everybody wants to be in the know and as, just, just as sophisticated as everybody else. And then they just, they sort of repeat the same things to one another and then they get more and more detached from anything happening in the real world. How difficult is it to um, step out of that water cooler conversation on an issue in Washington, whether you are... Well, I've never tried, <laughs> so... But you know what I mean? How, how difficult? I mean, the Washington consensus. How difficult to sort of stand apart from this? I'm, I want to tee this up for you and then come back to Mark because I think that's part of the message around the Obama administration, too. Yeah. Well, um, I, I think the trouble is that when you step out of that Washington consensus, it's usually for uh, some more ideologically defined echo chamber, um, whether on the right or the left. And, uh, and so, um, you know, it, it, it doesn't seem to be a, a place that really rewards independent thinking. Yeah. Um, you, one of the things you talk about in the book is the way in which the, the Washington culture, uh, and this isn't unique to the 2008 campaign, we've seen other campaigns and do this was sort of uh, one of the things that the Obama campaign was running against, this idea of establishment Washington. And at the same time, um, w the Washington establishment is working to subsume the administration in various ways uh, once it's there. And yet the Obama administration, you know, in some cases is, is subsumed and in other cases it's not working enough. What, what do you make of what we've seen in these last you know, five years of the Obama administration and how it's tried to wrestle with this sense of changing Washington. Well, I mean, I think that the president himself has said that, I mean, it was obviously something he did not succeed in, in his first term. But I do think that obviously the Obama administration is not a 
monolith. I mean, it's made up of individuals with different goals and different agendas and different you know, experience bases and, and, and so forth. Um, look, I, I think if you go back to 2008, it was an incredibly compelling message at the time. I mean, there was an incredible thirst then as there is now for something that's, that seems fresh, seems to make sense, that promises change. Uh, I don't doubt that the president was sincere then and is sincere and frustrated now by what's possible and what's not possible. Um, I mean, I do think that a lot, I mean, basically the people who are around the president who helped get him elected in 2008 have come from this political class. I mean, many of them lived in Washington. I mean, David Plouffe, Robert Gibbs, I mean, Anita Dunn, I mean, the whole inner circle of the 2008 campaign, except for David, uh, actually came from, you know, inside of town. And, and look, I mean, I don't, again, I don't, I don't, I don't question the sincerity of the message and, and the people who, who helped come up with it, but I mean, ultimately, this is a world that they knew. And I don't know if that made them any more susceptible or less susceptible to being subsumed or co-opted or, or what, but I mean, I think that that's the reality, certainly in retrospect. Let's take questions from those of you here. We're going to bring a microphone up to you. We've got a lot of hands going up. Um, Jan has a microphone. Let me start here, and then once she asks a question, Jan, I'll have you move all the way to the back and work, work back down. Yeah. Yes. Hi. I was curious who in Washington is doing things right, and who do you think is a public servant in the true sense of the word? <coughs> in a book that actually tells lots of tales out of school, that might be the toughest question. Um, right? You know, it's, I think <laughs> it's actually arguably the most important question, and I don't get it enough, frankly, and I would say a couple of things. One, I want to reiterate what Amy said because it's actually true and I think it's missed, is that this book actually does on some level come from a place in my own heart of, of idealism. Um, of, I mean, am I a cynic? Is this book cynical? Yeah, probably. I mean, I'm a reporter in Washington. You get used to being talked to in a certain way, you know, in the language of obsequiousness, in the language of spin, in the language of flat out lies, um, in the language of whatever. I mean, it's, it wears you down. Um, so, yeah, I plead guilty to that. But uh, there's another distinction I want to make, um, which is that the vast majority of people who work in Washington, D.C. are not in this book and would be horrified to be in this book. And, um, you know, quite a few of them lost their lives last week at the, the Naval Yard or two weeks ago at the Naval Yard. Um, and that actually was, was interesting because that tragedy sparked a couple of blog posts that I read about how, you know, these are people who are not of this town. You know, this is the people that are not in Mark's book or are not on cable or not, you know, who are not looking for themselves in the index that doesn't exist in, in the book. Um, and look, I mean, the city is filled with these people. I, I do, for whatever reason, and, and people might draw a completely different conclusion from reading this, I mean, I like a lot of politicians um, on both sides. I, I think that a lot of them come into it for the right reasons. I don't know if they stay in it for the right reasons, but um, I mean, pe people have said that Harry Reid and Tom Coburn have come out as like unlikely heroes in this book. And these are two people who are completely different political animals. One's an institutionalist who runs the Senate. One has been called the father of the Tea Party by some, Senator Coburn. They despise each other. Um, and yet, they both strike me as very honest in their own strange ways, and I tried to flesh that out. Right. Let's go um, back up here. Yes, all the way in the back, and we'll come down. Hi, everyone. Well, this question's kind of inspired by the last chapter of your book. You talked about that party, and like a few months after that party, the Washington Post was very unexpectedly sold. So I'm wondering how a sale like that, especially to someone who is so outside of DC culture, is going to kind of affect the oxygen of, of the city coverage day to day? Yeah. Um, it's a fascinating question. I mean, I, I have to say, um, I mean, as I'm a Washington Post alumnist, and I spent longer there than I did anywhere, have ever anywhere else, including the Times, and I still consider the Washington Post the home team in, in many ways. So I am very much rooting for it. I mean, I think Jeff Bezos, look, I think it's an exhilarating choice. I, I think that I mean, he obviously has money. Um, he obviously, I, I hope, is committed to um, trying to sort of visit some of his in innovation on trying to reinvent the Washington Post and, and, frankly, our business in general, which has been in great need of reinvention for a while. I mean, I think he, um, look, he's a man of great ideas. I, I mean, I think as a journalist, what scares me is, 
when he talks about, you know, at Amazon, we are obsessed with the customer, the customer, the customer, the customer. And in the sort of intrinsic arrogance of the journalist, when we think of customers, we, we think of market research. We think of, all right, give the readers the stories about their pets that they crave. Yeah, <laughs> nothing against pets. Um, and so that, that scares me. And the other question is, I mean, is, is this a hobby for Jeff Bezos, like the clock he owns in the desert, or uh, his, like, outer space tourist business? And um, is this just a new toy? And, you know, it's just sort of a drop in the bucket for his wealth. But I'm certainly rooting for it and him. All right, other questions? Uh, yes, we'll go right here, and then we'll bring the microphone down to the middle, if you don't mind. Okay, I'm uh, wondering about your motivations in writing this book, because a lot of what you talk about is how uh, the media in Washington has added to the frenzy, has made problems worse. So why did you think you needed to also write a book about Washington, and what message did you have to add? Uh, <laughs> fine question. My, 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 uh, <laughs> yes. my, uh, my, my wife has asked that question many times in the last year, so it seems like an important book. Why do you have to be the one writing it? Um, look, I, I would say this. I think the, the nature I mean, it's my nature, maybe it's the nature of journalists, but also people, and I think the best people in politics is risk-taking um, and listening to your own comfort and maybe running against it a little bit. Um, the fact is, I think people, I mean, I am part of this culture. I don't claim anything else. I don't claim to be a foreign correspondent. But I, I think that, look, there's a world that we all know and, the, and who are, that we all as people who are in this world are aware of, are frustrated by, and are yet sort of continue to sort of experience the, the crushing sameness of it all. And um, I don't know, I guess I just sort of wanted to write, a, I guess, what's sort of a different book, but um, maybe one that, that forced some discomfort upon me and upon everyone else, and sort of hopefully it'll start a conversation, and, and I think it has. I mean, much more so outside of town, but to my incredible, you know, gratitude. I mean, more. S I think the quality of the conversation outside of town has been much better than inside of town, which has been much more focused on the titter tatter and you know who comes off best, who comes off worst, and so forth. But it's, um, I don't know. I mean, I guess I felt like I had a book to write, and for about two and a half years, I was wondering if I did, and then all of a sudden, I was done, and now people are reading it. So. What, what were the biggest moments of self-doubt or challenges you had as you were going through this project? A constant. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, well, um, no, I mean, th this was a hard book to write. I mean, I, I, I'm not one of these reporters who can just, like, sit down and just, like, tap out the, the book and the story and, and what have you. I have this great moment where um, I was sitting next to Dan Balls on a plane, Dan Balls of the Washington Post, who's a great journalist and a really good friend, who um, I remember it was... I was doing a story on Hillary Clinton in the 2008 campaign, and I had to rewrite the top of the story. It was for Sunday on a flight from the s northern tip of Indiana to the southern tip of Indiana. I think we landed in Louisville. And it was a terribly turbulent flight, and I'm not very fast anyway. And I don't really do hard news leads very well. And I just basically, within two seconds, my head was between my legs. And Dan was sitting next to me. And he just was tapping away. <laughs> and he closed his laptop. And in that um, harrowing 45-minute flight, he had written a perfectly clean 2,000-word lead-all for um, the Sunday <laughs> Washington Post, which looked perfect. But no, I mean, the process was painful. It was, um, there was a lot of stuff I cut out. There was a lot of, um, you know, being yelled at by my wife and being disappointed by my kids. I mean, it has an incredible toll. And, and, and frankly, you know, I had a real job for much of it. And um, it was not a clean, straight ahead operation. So I, I suffered here. And, um, you know, I, I what about what to put in and what to leave out? That was tough, too. I think it was less tough. Um, I mean, one of the things I wanted to do with this book is I didn't, I, I actually left out some stuff that I think is newsworthy and stuff that Politico would probably put on its front page tomorrow. In fact, I know they would put it on their front page tomorrow because they were asking about it, and I didn't tell them. But no, I didn't you, want this book. Want to share it? No. Here? no. <laughs> <laughs> I could actually. <laughs> no, I didn't want this book to be given over to the. Okay, this is what was going on in the White House. This is who was fighting with who. I mean, there's some of that, um, but I do think that I, I wanted to try to transcend what I hope would be the basic Washington read of a book like so many, and, and I think like this to some degree, but I think 
in order to transcend that echo chamber, I wanted to not lard it up with that many shiny objects. The, the Washington read of a book being, you know, a scan looking for a juicy right. tidbit that's newsworthy in that moment. Um, yeah, let me come right to the middle here. The, with the By the way, I will stay after for as long as anyone wants. Yeah, to, we'll take uh, a couple more questions, wrap, to, and then. But no, I will like if whatever you guys want. Well, thank you. Uh, this question is really for everybody. Um, I wanted to know. So, if you strip away all of the incentives, all the seven-figure salaries, all the private jets, the champagne, everything. Do we have good governors? And I don't mean governors as in state governors. Like, are people governing well? Are they doing things that are effective for our country? And take that in whatever you want to, however you want to interpret that as in terms of effectiveness. Well, I mean, the federal government isn't operating now, so I guess you, you, can, <laughs> you can eliminate that part of the equation. No, no. I mean, I would glibly say, yeah, there are some, and not. A, I mean, I don't know. I think it's it different. It's different across the board. I mean, you guys want to take a crack at that? Or? This um, some years ago that uh, somebody had been around DC for a long time and said that as a group, the uh, members of Congress were much better personally than they used to be, much less um, uh, philandering and fewer drunkards, less less like you know sacks of money, uh, and yet somehow the outcomes are all worse, <laughs> and. Uh, uh, that's sort of uh, sort of my impression as well, and it, what it suggests to me is that the the problem is not fundamentally a characterological one, but a structural one. Um, I, let me come back really quickly on the stru when you say structural. What do you mean? Well, I, I suspect that a lot of it has to do with uh, the increasing polarization of the populace at large uh, and uh, the political, increasing political segregation of, uh, of the populace at large, the fact that we have more landslide counties and more landslide states than we had in 1976, um, to use the comparison year that the book The Big Sort uses. And um, uh, people talk less frequently to people of different political views, um, and they harden in their own views. Uh, I suspect that sort of thing is uh, is what's driving a lot of the dysfunction in DC. I should point out as a plug for Amy's seminar in particular, that's at the core of her focus for the 10 weeks she's here at the Institute. She'll be kicking that off tomorrow at 4.30 at the Institute of Politics. Ramesh you can catch on Tuesdays, Robin on Mondays, all of them with themes that in some respects uh, will intersect with what Ramesh just talked about. But that is at the core of what Amy's going to be talking about. Let me take one more question. We'll go to David to close. Look him right um, here in the middle. Yeah, if you can get a right across there. Um, given that the picture doesn't sound so good, it sounds kind of bleak with the government shut down. Do you all have suggestions for avoiding cynicism? Let's let each of you uh, chew on that. Amy, do you want to? Kick it. Um, don't start working for the f at the federal level. <laughs> I mean, honestly, if you want to get something done and feel a sense of accomplishment, working at the state and local level, working at the city level, working at the precinct level is going to give you that. And more important, you're not, it's not sexy. You're not going to get on Mark Leibovich. Probably isn't going to write a book about you. Sorry, <laughs> That's or a profile. That's one benefit of doing this. <laughs> <laughs> It's really good profile. Your birthday won't be in playbook. Um, Probably will but be. But I, I, I will say this: the be, the best job I ever had was I covered the house for ten years and I interviewed like two hundred candidates every year, and uh, these were uh, people who, some of them were incredibly um, smart, talented. Some of them were very, uh, I'm sure, had good manners or something. I mean, you know, they're. There were not. There were some that had other attributes besides being smart and effective. But the point being, every single one of those people woke up one day, said, "I'm going to come to Washington and make a difference," and they all believed it, even though there was less than, even in the best case scenario, there was a less than 50% chance they were going to win. Even though they gave up time with their family, they gave up salary, they gave up all of the comfort that they had because they thought they could go 
and make a difference. And that is the reason I am still in Washington and I'm not cynical. Uh, well, not completely cynical. <laughs> is that those people still come to Washington year after year and you can call them naive and you could say that's silly and how do you think you can make a difference? I mean, I would say that to them, right? You're gonna be number 435 in the minority. You're gonna be like last in seniority on the government operations committee. Like, no, you're not gonna go in and, and transform the entitlement system when you're elected. But they really do believe that they're gonna make that difference. And um, those people are still coming to Washington every day. You can be one of those people if you choose to. You can also choose to be one of those people who you can get on TV very quickly by being the opposite of that. So it's, it really is up to you. Robin? Well, she stole what I was gonna say, which is uh, get out of Washington. Uh, I think given what's happening there right now, uh, I don't think it's a permanent state, but I think it's gonna be a state for a while but there are still essential functions that we need to have our government provide. And more and more states and cities are gonna be figuring out really innovative ways to do that. They're trying to figure out how to use technology better, to use the tools that we're using in our everyday lives to have government function better. And it's really cool stuff. And so if you wanna figure out how to make a difference, I say go into a city, go into a state government agency and use all your creativity and innovation to make the place work better. Uh, and you'll walk out having made a bigger impact on your community than anything you're gonna do in Washington. Last word to Ramesh and then we'll close with Mark and David. Sure, um, well I think Washington is full of idealism. Um, and if you do go there and somebody needs to, uh, the, the trick is uh, for it to be tempered by experience, but not extinguished. And uh, that you've got to learn to distinguish between um, something that's often called cynicism, but is really just an accurate understanding and blunt description of cynical behavior and cynicism itself. Uh, and that's not something that I can give anybody a formula for, but I, I do think it is possible. Mark, your final thoughts on this? Oh, well, just, I mean, first of all, I agree with what everyone just said. I mean, I, I think I would maybe put it slightly differently. We're just, just keep your heart open. I mean, yes, I mean, cynicism, I think, is, is appropriate in many cases. Um, I wrote a whole book that people have said, you know, has elements of that. But no, I mean, again, I mean, you, you somehow you need to keep your heart open. And there are moments in the political world where you can see that. And almost always it takes place well, not almost always, but it, it takes place quite often outside of town. And um, I mean, this was a staged political event, but I remember see, being at a Mitt Romney event in near Toledo um, somewhere, I guess, last year or two years ago. No, last year. And they did the, you know, big, the Pledge of Allegiance, um, and, and everyone was asked to stand. And this Korean war, war veteran in a wheelchair, like, literally had to be helped out of his chair just so he could rise to salute the flag, and, and he was in terrible pain. I mean, he had to be like well into his 80s or 90s. And it was an incredible moment just to see that you know, struggle just so he could do this. And, and then I think, actually I described that in the book, and then two seconds later I looked down at my Blackberry and the DNC had just put out a new ad ridiculing Ann Romney's um, horse. Um, so you have this juxtaposition of like the absurdity and the momentous next to each other, but you have to somehow stay open to you know, that which makes this all beautiful. So. David, let me give you the last word and question. <coughs> well, uh, I, I feel, I think you asked a very appropriate question given the nature of the conversation. So I just want to add my voice to the others and say, you know, I spent two years in Washington, very difficult time. There is the polarity that Ramesh speaks about and there are structural reforms that are necessary. But I saw, I saw some very great things happen in the midst of all this. I saw the country come through a very difficult financial and economic crisis. I saw, you know, we, we would probably have a difference on the health reform uh, that passed, but three, four million people went online today who probably don't have health insurance in May. Um, some would, I consider that a, a big thing. Uh, but the point is that government is going to, government is going to go on, uh, one hopes. And, uh, 
And the quality of it is going to depend in large measure on the, the, the quality of the people who go into it. And uh, I think the cautionary note of Marx is don't get seduced by um, the celebrity culture of Washington. Um, I, I disagree with Ramesh on the, I think there are a lot of phony friendships in Washington. Harry Truman said, if you want a friend in Washington, get a dog. I remember <laughs> my friend uh, David Wilhelm, who was chairman of the Democratic National Committee from 1992 to 94, uh, was fired after the midterm elections, and they asked him what he was going to do next, and he said, I'm going back to Chicago where at least they stab you in the front. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, which is a great virtue of our town here. <laughs> um, but I have the last question uh, for uh, Mark, which is, um, I got an invitation, and I was surprised to get it. I thought it was sort of an ironic invitation from David Leonhardt, the bureau chief of the New York Times, and it was a book party for your book. And I was wondering if you saw any irony in that, and will this be the first chapter in your sequel? <laughs> first of all, there will, I shouldn't say there, I, there will not be a sequel. Um, but I thought it was actually funny. Um, yes, it was filled with irony. In fact, I remember the, <laughs> I had to give, a, I gave a little speech at that thing, and the first line was, okay, I am now drowning in meta. <laughs> I'm now drowning, I am now going to be all the people that I mock. Um, and the truly absurd, the absurd of it. I think Jay Carney actually that day was asked in the briefing room uh, if he had read the book, and he said, no, but I'm hoping for an invite to the book party. <laughs> and I immediately emailed Jay. I said, you know, you can come if you want. I thought, I thought we invited you, and he said, I can't believe you've reduced me to groveling from the podium. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, no, filled with irony. And um, yeah, I, I chuckle sometimes. I probably cringe sometimes, and it's all, um, look, it's all fair game. I wish you'd come. <laughs> I didn't want to. I would have felt corrupted by, <laughs> by being there. I mean, I read, you know, after your book, I, I was self-conscious. That's fine. That's so we invited you here instead. That's great. <laughs> so no. I just want to say thank you uh, so much for being here. Um, I think this is an important discussion to have. Um, I do want to say I think that there, I, I want to just reiterate that despite all of this, um, there is reason to be deeply, deeply involved in this process. We can improve it, but great things do happen despite ourselves, and, uh, and you guys can be the key to that. So I want to, I, I, I'm repeating myself, but it's an important point. So, but thank you very much, Mark, for, and for all of you. Thank you, thank you very much. <laughs>